So we're, we're starting this morning with a new series. For the month of January, I decided to look at some new things. And the, the idea that we're looking at is, uh, well, with a new year, we expect new things. And there's nothing new about that. It's not that, that something magical happens in 2021 that we all of a sudden anticipate new things. It's something that we do every year. We look to the future every year anticipating bigger and better things. Now, I don't know what those might be for you, but, but if you're like many people, or I might say even most people, if you look back to 2020, you may say, you know, it's a little bit, now for you younger that don't have a car, you may have to ask somebody about this, but it may be a little bit like, your old car that burns oil, runs on three cylinders, and all four tires are bald. What do you look forward to? You look forward to getting that new car. And, and so you look at last year and you may say, it's a little bit like that, that old car of mine. What are you looking forward to? Maybe for you it's a new job. Maybe for you it's a new home. Maybe it's the possibility of a new relationship. Whatever it is, you know, this, this new desire is reflected in a want for a change, wanting something new. As I thought about it, I realized uh, some of you have known Darcy and know that a few years ago she had some chronic knee pain. And it, was, it limited her activity and movement and until she got a new knee. And she got the new knee you know, early December, I think it was, and by March, we were able to go on some hikes with very limited pain. And, and that was huge. It was due to this pain that caused this desire for something new that resulted in an ability to do something that wasn't previously able to be done. I think we understand that idea. I think we get that idea of, of what it is to look for something new, especially as we look to the new year. And so as I said, during the first five weeks here of the new year, during the month of January, we're going to be looking at messages that deal with this idea of new beginnings in the new year. And we'll look at new things that are ours because of what Christ has done for us. So we'll be looking at five things over the next five weeks. We'll be looking at becoming a new creation, finding a new peace, receiving a new covenant, celebrating a new life, and discovering a new way of living. And so today's section, we're going to begin by looking at 2 Corinthians 5. And here in 2 Corinthians 5, we, we find kind of one of the, the greatest verses that talk about this, about the promise of how we are made new creations through the power of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning as we look to these verses and other verses today that we'll be encouraged by what you have done. The promise of a, being made a new creation will be something that we can rest in. We look forward to seeing what you are going to show us today, Lord. Amen. There's an old saying that I'm sure you've heard before. When you see the word therefore, you ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? And here we go back to the previous few verses, back through verses 14 through 16, where it reminds us or tells us of what we have when we place our faith in Christ. We're told there that, that we have died with Christ and that we no longer live for ourselves. 
Previously, we were dead in our sins, in our sin nature. But now, new life has come. New life has come as this old life was nailed to the cross with Christ. You see, we're told in Romans it is buried with Him. And just as we are raised up by the Father, so are we raised up to walk in newness of life. And this new person that is ours, this new creation that was raised up that Paul refers to here in 2 Corinthians 5.17 is referred to as a new creation. So before we begin, begin to look at these verses from 2 Corinthians 5, I thought it might be good and might be helpful for us to go back and ask the obvious question of how do we become a new creation? How are we made new? I think part of the answer is found in Romans 1 where Paul tells us they were made new by the power of the Gospel. Romans 1.16 says this, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Salvation, we find, is a work of God, changing that which was not into that which is. There's a few examples I wanted to mention. First, we find in Romans 6 that due to the sin that we've inherited from Adam, we're told that we are dead in our sins and that we need a new life. When you are dead, you long for, you look for life. Romans 6, 6 through 11. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our life. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over Him. When He died, He died once to break the power of sin. But now that He lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive, alive to God through Christ Jesus. Though we were once dead, we are promised to be made alive in Him. We've been transformed by the power of the Gospel, by the power of God. The second thing I wanted to note here is that because our sin has alienated us from this relationship with God, Christ provided a means for that relationship to come about. In fact, He tells us that we can now be the children of God. John 1, 12 and 13. But to all who believed Him and accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. You see, now as a child of God, now having an identity with God, we are part of His family. A child is part of the family. But you see, before, that wasn't the case. We've read this verse before when we went through 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2.10 told us, once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, but now you have received God's mercy. When I was thinking about these things, an uh, old Stephen Curtis Chapman song came to my mind, which says this in the, in the lyrics. It says, When the world was broken, fallen, and battered, and scarred, you took the hopeless, the life wasted, ruined and marred, and made it new. You make all things new. You redeem and you transform. You renew and you restore. You make all things new. You see, this is the work that God has done. He's made all things new. That's the hope of the Gospel, the promise that He will make you new. Making you new means that he will make you a new creation. 
He will make what was not into what is. He will bring life to what is dead. He will make us his new creation. You see, only the gospel has the power to change us. Change us, deliver us from the sin that once ruled our life. Deliver us from Satan. Deliver us from judgment. Deliver us from death. To deliver us from hell. We were reminded of this in our study of the book of Acts. In Acts, Peter answers a question we oftentimes hear today of who then can be saved. Aren't all ways leading to God? Acts 4, 11 and 12. This is what we read. Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given by people by which we must be saved. Jesus came for a single person. He came to seek and to save the lost. The saving was done by the transformation that He brings to us. The saving is done by transformation being done in us. We are made new because we couldn't save ourselves. The old self in me couldn't do anything. It was powerless because of that sin. We're made new in Christ so that we might have eternal life. That we might become that new creation in Christ. I wonder if you've ever stopped and given thought to what that means. What does it mean to become a new creation? As we think about it, sometimes we hear others saying that this idea of when I come to Christ, when I come to faith, God comes in, throws out all the trash, and refurbishes what's there. But you see, that's not the case. Because what's there isn't It's like that old house that isn't worth refinishing. As much as we may be attracted to it, there there isn't anything there. If we seek to rebuild on that, we're building on a foundation that won't last. But Jesus says in Matthew 7, it's, it's like building a house on sand. But there's something better. There's something better that we're told here, that That God has done something new. He's he's made a new creation. And I think as we grasp this image that He's given us, of the image of creation, we see and recognize that this is is something that's been created by God. Again, from John 1.13, we're told that He has done this to give us new birth. It's brought about not by the will of man, but by the will of God. We didn't inherit this new nature. We didn't decide to recreate ourselves into something new. But it was done by the will of God. God didn't simply clean up our old self, but He made us new. He created something entirely fresh, something unique, something that we so desperately needed. Only the Creator could accomplish such a feat. In the the mid-80s, I worked with international students at USU. And in the process, I had the opportunity to go to Pasadena, California, where there was what was called the World Center of Missions. And while there, I was able to hear one of the lecturers talk about something that struck me and has stayed with me. He was a lifetime missionary to the Philippines. And his message was for a lesson that he had learned while being in the Philippines. It was simply this. That as we communicate the gospel, we don't just start with the good news that Jesus died to save sinners. I mean, that's true. But what he recognized, if I start there, I'm likely to build on a false foundation. Because in the Philippines, like here, There's many false beliefs, false understandings of who God is. And if I don't understand who God is, and I say, we're a sinner in need of repentance, I'm not going to understand what that means. 
And so his advice that I think was wise was we need to, if you will, rebuild that foundation to find who God is against whom we are accountable for. In doing that, then people can understand what it means to be a sinner, what it means to be saved. And we can receive Christ and rejoice in what He has done. Again, when Christ enters our life, He doesn't simply do a renovation. He creates something new. The old things have passed away. When we're made new creations, I think one other thing that we find is there's a new way of thinking that we have as well. No longer do I look at things like I once did. No longer do those things that once had power or authority over me have that same power or authority because as a new creation, I look to the world differently. Instead of looking inward to find my identity and my hope, I now am able to look to Christ. Those old things, we're told, have been nailed to the cross with Christ. From Ephesians 2, we see some things that were once true and some things that are now true. Listen to Ephesians 2. It says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, but now you have been united with Christ. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. In 1 John, we find another thought that helps us here. It says, And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. This is what He has done. Once this was true, but as a new creation, now this is true. It's a work that God promises to do with us. It isn't dependent upon my goodness, my rightness, but it's all dependent upon Him. Remember how He made creation out of nothing? He's done the same with us. Here are some of the things that He has promised to us. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1, made alive in Ephesians 2, raised with Christ through faith in Colossians 2, forgiven of all my trespasses as well. The new birth didn't make us better. It made us a new creation. That's important for us to grab onto. It didn't simply make you better. It made you new. The things that once were true are no longer true. Listen again to 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. This is from the New Living Translation. I like the way it phrases this. Your translation, if you have a different one, might word it just slightly different. But I like the way that it puts it in the past tense. It has already begun. It isn't a future thing that we're looking for. But it's already started. It's not a vague hope in the future that I really hope that it someday might happen. No, it's It's what He's already done. And I can cling to this. I can hold on to it because it is mine right here and now as I place my faith in Christ. And then over in chapter 6, a few verses later, He declares this, 2 Corinthians 6, 2, For God says, At just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is a day of salvation. There's lots of times when we talk to folks, maybe you've thought this as well, that they think, well, you know, I don't know if I'm ready yet. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know, but none of those things really matter. The promise is that Christ died for us now. Not until we get our act together, if you will, but that today is the day of salvation. Yes, there's a future hope embedded in this, but it even more speaks of the very present and real hope that I can have today. A hope of salvation that the psalmist also picked up on. Psalm 46.1 God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Have you been there? Have you been in a place of, of just needing hope now? 
I mean, yes, I want hope for tomorrow, but I don't even have the energy to look to tomorrow. I need hope now. That's what Christ died to give us. The promise that we are made a new creation begins the moment we believe and carries us on into eternity. The good news of the gospel is for all who believe. But it doesn't end there, of course. Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians 5 to speak of the mission, if you will, of the follower of Christ. <coughs> Verses 18 and 19. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to Him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. No longer counting people's sins against them. When we come to faith in Christ, we're made a new creation. The old doesn't matter. And now we've been called out, equipped to be a witness for Him. If you look around, I don't think most of you, at least, uh, were watching American TV in the 70s. Um, if you were, maybe you have a memory. I doubt it, though. But there was a commercial by Fabergé Shampoo. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember Fabergé Shampoo. I don't know if it exists anymore. But for whatever reason, it was a commercial that stuck in my mind. It was, this, it was a commercial that showed the exponential power of social networking, which we understand today, of course. The idea was this, this lady in the ad is, is telling two friends who tell two friends who tell two friends and so on and so on, the commercial said. You see, that's the power of sharing the good news. The commercial sought to have you buy their product and tell your friends about how wonderful this Fabergé organic shampoo was. But that's the same thing that we have. And believe it or not, the gospel message is even better than Fabergé shampoo. It's eternal, isn't it? It's good news. And as we share it with others, then they will see and find that good news. And that's what we are being called to do. In fact, the next verse, verse 20, words it this way. It says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making His appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If you remember back when we studied the book of Acts, we saw there of how we are called to be Christ's witnesses. Here, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 calls us to be Christ's ambassadors. The words are just ever so slightly different. The witness testifies to what he sees and knows. The ambassador, on the other hand, testifies to what they have been told. Both are the mission, if you will, of the follower of Christ. As Christ's ambassadors, we are speaking a singular message. Be reconciled to God. We saw something else there as well, didn't we, back in verse 19, that he is no longer counting people's sins against them. That's good news. And we may say, yeah, but you don't know how many sins I have against me. It doesn't matter. Christ died for them all to make you a new creation. You see, as Christ's ambassadors, we come with a singular message again, be reconciled to God. That, that phrase speaks of both the need and the means. The need, of course, is that we have a problem that needs to be reconciled. And that Jesus is that answer. As Christ's ambassadors, we don't, we do not speak our opinion, but His truth. We don't speak in our name. We don't speak in our church's name. We speak in Christ's name. For that's the name that saves. We testify of what we have been 
told, we testify of what we have seen, we testify to any who will listen. We seek to bring Him glory, not ourselves. Maybe we can join Paul in preaching the good news as he says in Ephesians 6. And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan and that, and that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, so preaching this message as God's ambassador. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for Him as I should. So what exactly is this good news? I mean, we've been told to preach this message, be reconciled to God, but what is it? One of my favorite summaries of that good news is the next verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, where it says this, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. God took that which knew no sin, that perfect sinless sacrifice, offered Him, offered His life on the cross for us so that our sins could be forgiven. So that what? So that we may be made right with God. How can that which is dead be made alive? How could that who has no identity find a home? Through Christ by being made right with Him. Being reborn when we've been purchased with His blood. There's an old story. Maybe you've heard it before. I think maybe I've even shared it before. But it's a story about a father and son. And the father and son are working on a project in the garage making this little sailboat. It's a project that they worked on day and night throughout the years until it was finally done and ready to set sail. So the father ties a string on it, lets it out in the lake for its trial run, and it is beautiful. It's doing wonderful, of course, until that motorboat comes along and cuts the string, and away goes the little ship. Search and search and search for it, and we're never able to find it. A few weeks later, the story goes, the the boy is walking past his favorite toy store, and there it is in the window. His sailboat. The one that his father and him had made. He's excited and goes in and tells the owner of the store, that's my boat. And the owner explained that he had found the boat while on a fishing trip. And he said, you may be its maker, but I, I as its finder and the legal owner. You can have it back, but bring $50, and it's yours. Well, of course, that made the boy very sad. He was stunned about how much it was going to cost him to regain his boat. And so he sets off to earn the money. Months later, he joyfully comes back to the store, bringing his $50 with him, and buys back the boat that he and his father had built. The story says that it was the happiest day of his life, and he left the store holding tight. He said, I made you, but I lost you. Now I have bought you back. That makes you twice mine, and twice mine is mine forever. You see, the cost for the boy to purchase the boat back maybe seems unfair to us, but it illustrates it illustrates the cost of our own redemption, does it not? Once again, remember back to our verse from John chapter one, verses eleven through thirteen. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, He gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. My redemption was obtained for me at the cross. It's plain and simple. It wasn't by me trying harder. It wasn't by me doing better. It wasn't by any of those things. It was by what Christ has done for us at the cross. 
we're told elsewhere of how he died for the ungodly. That's you and I. I love the way Hebrews talks about these things. Hebrews 9, especially 12 through 14, says this. With his own blood, not with the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal Spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. What are we called to? Well, when we put our faith in Christ, we're called to be his ambassadors. What is our message? Be reconciled to God. How is that possible? Well, by resting in the promises, the hope that we have that's been purchased for us on the cross. In closing, as I thought about it, there's one other verse that came to my mind. What amazes me is we look to the Old Testament to see the prophecies that were hundreds of years earlier told about what Christ would do. This one from Psalm 111. Verse 9, it says, He has paid a full ransom for His people. He has guaranteed His covenant with them forever. What a holy, awe-inspiring name He has. You see, for the follower of Christ, we have a great promise of being remade into this new creation. The old, the dead things, are replaced with new things full of life and full of the glory of God. Our purpose, our feelings, our desires, our understandings are fresh and different. We see the world differently. For the first time, we see the Bible as the living Word of God rather than a historic book. Our attitudes and thoughts towards others are made new. We have this new kind of love for our family and friends as well. A new compassion that we have never had before for our enemies. Things that we once loved that led to our despair, we now detest. The sin that once held on to us, we are now set free from. Colossians, we're told that we put off the old man with his deeds. In Ephesians, we're told that we put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, this new creation that we are promised to be no longer lives as a slave to sin. We've been set free. Sin no longer has its power over us. Now we are empowered by God for His life. Being a new creation is a wonderful thing. Formed in the mind of God, created by His power for His glory. And having become this new creation by faith, in the weeks ahead, I hope we'll see more about what this looks like, what it means. As I said, next week, we'll be looking at the second part of this to the new peace that we have and the new covenant that establishes that, and the new life that we have in the new way of living. These are some of the new things. As we approach this new year, my hope is that we will look to it and see what is already ours in Christ. That if we've come to a place of faith, that we have those things already. For He's promised. He who has begun the good work in you has brought it to a close, has brought it to a finish. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that this morning as we think about all that you have done for us, that we will give you thanks and praise. Lord, we look forward to seeing what you are going to be doing. We give you thanks, Lord. Amen.